welcome to the United Nations 2023 World Water Conference and this side panel event is sponsored by Genesis Systems and NASDAQ on the new age of water investing in a time of scarcity. From here in Times Square at the second largest global securities marketplace on earth at NASDAQ, my name is Ron Jacobus and it's my distinct pleasure to be your host and the person to help this event that each and every one of you here today is a part of make its mark in history. It has been 40 years, 40 years since a global water conference. It's time to celebrate and create global change. And you are attending one of the marquee events being held outside the grounds of the UN so the message of water can reach the world. Now, before we get started, I've got just a few housekeeping notes. Since today's event is being broadcasted on video, please set your phones and any other electronic devices to silent in the venue. Now our event today is an official side panel of the United Nations World Water Conference, and it will be part of the body of information and ideas that work to shape the world and ensure that we solve the water challenges that lie ahead. Therefore, please exercise utmost professionalism. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce and welcome to the stage, Mr. Jack Johnson, who will introduce today's moderator. Mr. Jack Johnson is the former NATO senior enlisted leader who at one time led 90% of attached NATO personnel. As you may know, NATO is an alliance based on the shared values of freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. Mr. Johnson, the stage is yours. Good morning. I have the great privilege and pleasure to introduce our moderator today, Dr. Dr. David J. Stuckenberg. Now he asked me not to really go into specifics in his bio, but I think a person of, of his accomplishments deserves to be heard. So please bear with me. Dr. David J. Stuckenberg is a global influencer. He's an executive, a strategist, an entrepreneur, and an inventor. He has been called a young disruptor by NATO Allied Command Transformation. He's been called the George Keenan of this century by senior defense leaders and a national treasure by our former CIA director, James Woosley. Dr. Stuckenberg's executive experience spans governmental and industry from nuclear treaty of compliance to national critical infrastructures, all the way to high tech startups. He is frequently asked to speak at the White House, NATO, King's College, Citigroup, the United States Special Operations Command, the National Academy of Public Administration, in the Chatham House on strategic issues on the next of strategy, innovation, and technology. His research and ideas are known to be for their constructive dissonance, the ability to challenge the status quo while building a global consensus of meaningful challenge. Dr. Stuckenberg's national infrastructure resilience strategies and implementation programs are benchmarked by the White House as an exemplar for the United States cities and states, including the national, the nation's largest federal complexes. His groundbreaking work on strategy, gray zone warfare and modern military theory have influenced leaders at all levels and are the digest of leaders worldwide as a featured, as featured in Harvard, King's College, UN Guardian, Bloomberg, Forbes, and other leading publications. While serving in the United States State Department, Dr. Stuckenberg served as a delegate to the United Nations Special Committee member to the National Security Council and a subject matter expert and foreign affairs advisor. He's the architect of critical international peacekeeping programs that leveraged early and advanced technologies to strengthen international ties and reduce risk to both peacekeepers and the population that they protect. As a strategist, Dr. Stuckenberg established and led a Blue Ribbon Joint Chiefs of Staff Task Force, where he marshaled 150 organizations in groundbreaking research, leading to a presidential executive order. Completing his postdoctoral research at John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, Dr. Stuckenberg researched and understood that asymmetrical use of warfare as an instrument of societal control and the development of emerging federated supply side water technologies has been highlighted by the government as being very transformative. Dr. Stuckenberg leads a research team of more than a dozen scientists and engineers to speed the advancement of sustained water technologies. And in addition to that, 
David has served, or excuse me, has authored and co-authored 20 US and global patents. And finally, if that wasn't enough, Dr. Stuckenberg continues to serve as an officer in the Air National Guard, where he directs strategy for his state. As a veteran US Air Force pilot, Dr. Stuckenberg has flown more than 150 combat missions and has been awarded the Air Medal and six Aerial Achievement Medals. He serves as the chairman of the board for the American Leadership and Policy Foundation and the co-chair at the FBI Infrared Water, National Water Security Working Group. He holds a PhD in International Affairs and Strategy from King's College in London, a master's degree in politics from George Washington University, and a Bachelor's of Science and Technology from the University of Central Missouri. I say all these things not to embarrass you. The highlight is on our panel members, but I think it's important for someone with such dedication in leading what we believe is, is the future for our families and for global security. Ladies and gentlemen, and I introduce our moderator for today, Dr. David J. Stuckenberg. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I have a lot of uh, thank yous to get through. So um, no event like this comes together without uh, an incredible audience of uh, distinguished guests like yourself. I want to take a few minutes just to thank um, uh, some of you uh, for not only co-sponsoring and co-convening this event, um, <clears throat> but those of you who have uh, come an awful long distance. So uh, with that, uh, please allow me to get through uh, a, a list of uh, thank you, so bear with me one moment. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to start by introducing our extraordinarily distinguished panel today um, who have come from across the world um, to enlighten us uh, with some action steps uh, on uh, the topic at hand, which is water. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to introduce um, with uh, uh, the highest regard uh, the right Honorable Lord Goldsmith of the United Kingdom. Lord Goldsmith of Richmond Park is the Minister of State for Overseas Territories and Commonwealth Energy, Climate and Environment at the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office. The Minister's responsibilities include overseas territories, including the Falkland Islands, Commonwealth, Energy, Climate and Environment. He sits in the House of Lords and he was previously Minister for Asia uh, energy, Climate, and Environment at the FCDO from September to October 2022. I'm sorry, October 2022. <clears throat> Before that, he was the Minister for Rural Affairs, uh, DEFRA. He was first appointed as Minister of State in the Foreign uh, Commonwealth Office, the Department for International Development, and DEFRA on 13 February 2020. <clears throat> Before that, he was Minister of State at DEFRA at the DFID from 10 September 2019 and 13 February 2020, and Parliamentary Undersecretary of State at DEFRA and at DFID from 27 July and 2019 to 10 September 2019. Thank you very much. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Jay Heller. At NASDAQ, Jay Heller is Head of Capital Markets with over 25 years experience in the financial markets er arena. Jay was tasked by senior management to lead his team in analyzing and enhancing processes in which new listings are facilitated on the exchange. Over the years, NASDAQ has introduced several innovative tools leveraging data technology to provide greater transparency to IPOs, initial public offerings, and direct listings. Under his leadership, the team has executed more than 2,500 IPOs consisting of operating companies and SPACs. Some of the world's most innovative companies have gone public on NASDAQ during his tenure. Rivian, Mobileye, Coinbase, Lyft, TPG, Warner Music, Airbnb, and Global Foundries, just to name a few. Prior to joining NASDAQ in 2008, Jay was the Managing Director of Institutional Trading and Sales at American Capital Partners. There, he was partner on the institutional trading sales desk while working with various hedge funds and financial institutions. Jay has also worked as market manager, I'm sorry, market marker at Pershing 
Capital Markets and NDB Capital Markets subsidiary of Deutsche Bank. All right. Thank you, Jack. Next, I'd like to welcome Sir George Kearns. <clears throat> Mr. Kearns is chairman and CEO of MCC Worldwide. His experience includes transnational political business and security issues at the highest levels. Examples of Mr. Kern's range of international and domestic experience include chairman and CEO of MCC Worldwide, CMCC Development Group, facilitating multi-commodity free trade centers in countries such as Curacao, Botswana, but the Bahamas, and more. Seven years as an official advisor to the Honorable Amedo Berardi, Italian Parliament Chamber of Deputies, on international relations, economic development, and trade affairs matters affecting North America, Central America, the Caribbean Basin, and has been a member of the former Chairman of International and Economic Development for Smart States, an organization comprised of four United States Mid-Atlantic States, as well as their respective governor's offices, 39 congressional members, and eight senators. These examples, as well as an unwavering commitment to his fellow veterans, illuminate 40 years of integrity, innovation, and trust, the elements of a nexus of business, political, and cultural knowledge essential for conducting multinational business in the private sector and advising foreign and US governments on economic national security policies. Thank you. Next, I'd like to welcome our speaker, Paresh Galani. Paresh is a Vision Circle member and board of trustee at the XPRIZE Foundation. He is an avid entrepreneur and philanthropist who focuses on solving problems through innovation and entrepreneurship. He is currently active in building and investing in emerging technologies that have a positive impact on humanity. He believes in investing and mentoring companies and entrepreneurs who are taking moonshots and changing the world by building breakthrough technologies. One of Paresh's passion projects as a philanthropist is XPRIZE Foundation, which he leads and the, uh, to solve grand challenges through incentive prizes. Paresh, along with Ratan Tata and Naveen Jian, also brought the XPRIZE Foundation to India uh, to solve India's greatest challenges like health, sanitation, women's safety, and access to clean water, waste management, and other challenges. Fresh led the challenge to solve the atmospheric water extraction breakthrough to address access to safe drinking water for those who have zero access to water. Truly living by his motto, you can do well by doing good. Fresh has built and successfully exited numerous companies in the technology fields supporting large corporations and the US government. He is currently investing and mentoring numerous companies which are addressing breakthrough in supply side water technology, oncology, early detection of diseases, and clean tech breakthroughs. Through his body of work and achievements, Press sets an example as an entrepreneur, philanthropist, and is also an inspiration to young aspiring entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs around the world on a mission to make a positive impact uh, on humanity moving forward. Thank you, Press. Next, I'd like to welcome uh, to the panel, Dr. Uh, John Matthews, who I'm told I cannot call doctor from this point forward. So from now on, John, uh, and, uh, but uh, John is a resilient scientist and adaptation practitioner who has been working at the interface of water and climate globally since 2007. Um, you've stuck in there. Uh, so John co-founded the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation, AGWA in 2010 with World Bank, um, where he remains the executive director. His work explores how we define and accelerate the uh, uptake of our emerging set of best practices for water central climate resilience. He has led the development of new climate risk methodologies that have been used in dozens of countries and adopted by groups ranging from the state of California to UNESCO, prepared green bond water resilience criteria that have certified more than 15 million and US dollars in water resilience investments over six continents, chaired the first water day at the UNFCCC uh, COP and advised well over a hundred countries on their national climate commitments. He has been widely published on climate change and water topics through popular uh, technical and policy sources, including in science, nature, 
climate change and nature water. Thanks. Also on our panel is uh, Ted Kalaman. Uh, Ted uh, is joined Eight Points Asset Management as an intern in 2013 uh, at the firm's Manhattan headquarters and has risen to managing director in 2022. <clears throat> With over a decade of experience in finance and real estate, uh, Ted provides thoughtful and disciplined fact-based data-driven and quantitative decision-making that pairs rigorous reward analysis, analysis and risk management with deep domain expertise. He has been involved in sourcing, executing, and consulting on tens of millions of square feet valued at tens of billions of dollars to a diverse client base across domestic and international capital markets, transactions, and advisory services. Sectors of expertise include office, multifamily, retail, life sciences, industrial hospitality, data center, infrastructure, and development. Additionally, Ted has developed um, tax efficient investment vehicles for cross-border transactions. Some notable clients of his include uh, Blackstone, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Brookfield Asset Management, Cantor Fitzgerald, Mitsubishi, PNC Bank, NASDAQ, and the United Nations. Thank you, Ted. And last and not certainly least is Timothy Stuckenberg. I know him well as my son and an inspiring water expert at Genesis Systems. Today, Timothy is representing the world's youth on this panel at the request of the UN Secretary General, who requested that youth members be involved in all UN water conference activities because they are to be the recipients of what comes next. The plans and actions born of these important dialogues and the action steps that we take afterwards. This is his world that he will inherit and he represents his generation. So thanks for, for being here, Timothy. Quick on Timothy, he's a senior in high school in Tampa, Florida, and he works as a science, technology, uh, engineering, and math intern at Genesis Systems, uh, where he works alongside of a world-class team of scientists and engineers working to solve global water scarcity. When Timothy's not working to solve scarcity issues, he coaches both of his brother's little league baseball teams and is involved in several other volunteer activities. Okay, in addition uh, to our panel members uh, who will enlighten us today, I wanna take a, just a couple more moments to thank uh, the participants who are here in our audience. With that, it's a true privilege to have each of you here today to help start a fire, believe it or not, on water and water investment. We don't have to be shy about it. This is the water action decade. So let's get right into framing today's monumental conversations. All right, making sure this works. So we're gonna begin this morning's uh, conversation with opening comments. Some of you have decks uh, and we'll get through those today uh, in terms of water scarcity. I'd like to give you just a couple of thoughts as uh, I uh, lead off into George's conversation. And first and foremost, that is that today, approximately 40% of all of the water that we use around the world, and certainly in the United States, is groundwater. And what's interesting is that most of that groundwater was laid down over hundreds and hundreds of years. And often cases, uh, it, 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 it took even longer than that. And there was, uh, a sheet of ice over much of uh, North America. And there were mastodons and mammoths walking on that ice. When we today are using that same water, which is very limited. And so if you put it into uh, true context, there's obviously not a infinite amount of water available to us. And this is really meant to show that approximately 3% of Earth's water is fresh. I know many of you already know that, but there is only a small finite amount of that that we can actually access. And that represents on this chart, one pixel circled there uh, by the arrow. And so if we look at that and we begin to understand how thirsty industrialization is and the improvements that we are uh, you know, expecting for part of our everyday life, our water footprint, if you will, if you will um, we, we are borrowing from the future 
to take to pay today's debt for today's lifestyle and we cannot continue to do that so in terms of what this looks like um, it is observable and this is not a you know something nebulous uh, you can actually find the data in, in the center of this chart here. This data is actually from the Jet Propulsion Lab, and what this measures is the change um, to Earth's magnetic field, if you will, due to a change in density as water withdrawals happen over North America. And I'm using this as a one for all. This is one example of what's happening in the rest of the world. And if you look, the trend here over this 10-year data slice, it's a little bit dated, but this is the best chart uh, in which to present this. What we see is that the drier areas are becoming more dry and the wetter areas are becoming wetter. And this trend can be extrapolated throughout most of the world. And so everything we do in society from services to uh, production is dependent on water. And what's interesting is that water scarcity is beginning to manifest, especially in the most pop population dense areas around the globe. And that is a true concern. So the water, as we say, is going, going, gone. And that is truly why this uh, event has been convened, why it has, as one of the Sustainable Development Goals, SDG 6, has elevated itself to the top priority of all the SDGs, because without water, a, soci a, soci a society excuse me, will stop in, in about three days. Water, it can be said, is the economic potential energy of a nation. And everything we do requires it. And so uh, in our day-to-day -day life, we don't typically think about it. As humans, we use about 180 gallons a day throughout all of our various activities. And just a cell phone takes about 3,200 gallons of water to produce. So this water footprint has to be part of our calculus now. And we have a member uh, on this panel who helped uh, form an organization called CDP, which actually tracks this and tracks the impacts. And I hope we'll get into some of that today um, to understand what kind of impacts are happening right now to the business segment. The problem of water is not one that can wait. The uh, addressing this issue is on our doorstep. Food production stops, development stops, all of it stops without water. And you don't have to take my word for it. We have an extraordinary panel of experts here today that are going to talk to, to all of us about it. So where is the principal use of water uh, right now uh, in terms of the United States? Uh, and, and generally, this can be extrapolated as well across the world. It, generally, in our population centers, we are using more water. And predominantly, most of the water, about 80% of it is being used in agriculture and also in energy production. So those are the big users. Those are um, the water hogs, if we, if we can say that. And uh, we have to figure out how to uh, allocate that water in a sustainable way uh, or how to find new water sources. So one of the most concerning data points I've seen in all of the research I've done through the years um, uh, is here. This is from uh, Nature. It's generally a very simple graph to explain that as our population increases and we have just passed an extraordinary point in humanity's history where today it is estimated there are the same amount of people living that are equivalent to the same amount of people who have ever lived on Earth. Isn't that extraordinary? And as we have this desire uh, to bring up quality of life and make opportunity for people around the world, our water withdrawals are increasing. But the challenge here is this lower graph, and you can see this in, uh, uh, it's circled, where the availability of water and the demand for water swap ends. And this is a very dangerous uh, future if we allow this to continue without mitigation. And so this is what we're paying attention to today, and there it is in the data. So we have the opportunity to put all of these sustainable development goals uh, in balance as we begin to look at water. Um, water allows uh, diplomacy to move forward as nations can be stabilized. It allows food to grow. It allows economies to uplift and, and bring people out of poverty. All of these things, all of the SDGs, I would argue, are reliant upon a reliable water supply. So as we begin to think through solving this, 
the challenge for us today is to understand that we have to put powder behind the ball. We have to put wood behind the arrow. We can't just talk about plans. We can't just talk about partnerships. We have to begin the active doing stage. And in developing this, my challenge for us today would be to develop an ecosystem that is, a, is excited and energized and animated as those who are part of the space industry today. While we may not be making a moonshot here, we're making an earth shot and everything we do in outer space is gonna depend on what we do over the next decade. And so uh, in my organization, uh, in terms of our research has been involved in some time in trying to understand in a holistic sense, how do we begin to access freshwater supplies that we haven't accessed before? And what's interesting is that our atmosphere contains 37 quadrillion tons of water. This might be available for us as a renewable, replenishable water source. And so we've been looking at those kinds of technologies. And whether you agree with that or not, we have to get creative here. And that's how humanity has always done it. We've thought our way through the grand challenges. And so in terms of um, the global water supply, I've encouraged through in the preparatory meetings for the UN uh, and as we develop a more thorough understanding as a, as a scientific body and as a, a world in general to begin understanding the entire water cycle in its totality, not just the water that we can slosh around in a cup or draw out of a well or take from a lake, but also the water that's in the air around us. And if you think about it right now and you close your eyes and think about a 20 by 20 by 20 meter box, that is your water cube. Within that box are, is an amount of water vapor equivalent to everything you need daily. And for much of the world, that water just passes over. So my goal is to try to help people access that water in their water cube. And uh, we hope to make that uh, possible someday. What we have, again, uh, is a paradigm that I, I think the water industry and water thought practitioners uh, understand is not sustainable uh, and it largely centers on large infrastructure, huge capital projects that range from hundreds of millions to billions of dollars. How do we federate these systems? How do we make it affordable for small island communities? And how do we make sure that um, the, the little guys and the economically challenged areas aren't left behind? That's one of the commitments of my uh, uh, company, uh, our co-founders, and it's a commitment that we have made here at the UN is to make sure that we use all of our resources to ensure that uh, water supplies are uh, available to communities that would otherwise be left behind. And so um, we have to make sure that we keep those uh, at the forefront of our thinking as well. So those are my framing comments. Uh, these challenges are serious. We've heard a lot of... Uh, statistics thrown around uh, this week, but I think one of the most challenging is that uh, we are already as a world at 25% water scarcity. And some of the estimates that we've seen are uh, that we will reach 80% water scarcity for most of the world by 2050. Certainly estimates are estimates, but in these cases, we have a unique ability to actually measure the physical withdrawal and depletion of water supplies and in some cases, there's pictures around the room that have shown places like Cape Town, South Africa, where the water supply literally disappeared. So those are what these are the challenges ahead of us. And I look forward to the dialogue with each of you. Now we'll go over to George. Thanks. Well, I guess we'll, we'll start with what I do and why I'm here. Uh, it simply answers the question, how does a multinational corporation remain compliant in its home country while doing business with companies from countries that aren't compliant? And we solve, uh, we make it easy for simply for multinationals to do business around the world. Uh, patterned after what was done in Dubai, the DMCC and DIFC today combined, they probably have over 30,000 member companies that read like who's who in the world. Uh, our locations, Botswana, Curacao, Bahamas pending, 
Morocco, Oman, uh, Hunan, China, I think will be a license. It won't be one that I operate. But there are more too. We're looking at locations in Italy to build a global network of vetted uh, companies that can do business with each other in a streamlined manner, easing the flow of trade. The World Trade Center, for instance, 320 plus locations, 90 countries around the world, and probably more than a million participant companies isn't interconnected with having their companies vetted so that they can do business with each other. Um, that was the uniqueness of Dubai in the beginning and what drove the growth of Dubai. Um, this is just a list. Of, we have an office in Dubai to interface with the government of Dubai and their DMCC. Let's see. I need to get through these because I'm the long guy. Um, seamless business solutions, legally, globally compliant, uh, neutral and secured areas. What we do is we create expanded custom zones. Customs wants to make sure things don't get out of a zone and into the civilian population without the duties being paid. We're securing the zone from the outside because it's a, a city within the zone where you can safely do your business and safely store your valuables in the vaulting facilities that we work with groups like G4S, Transguard, Loomis, and uh, Brinks. Uh, the first major vaults in Dubai were Brinks. They're insurable to 4, million, 4 billion a vault. Uh, we already have covered this pretty much. We changed the political and financial risk analysis for somebody doing business with a good company from a non-compliant country. Um, this is uh, in Botswana. I have uh, 400 acres with flight line access. Uh, the overall plan that we have is much larger than that 400 acres, but this is an approved plan that was done it's about 1,400 acres, and then, but my first phase is 400. We put, just finished the roads here in November. Um, this is a new traffic circle. Give you an idea of the size or scope of, of this, this particular project. Uh, they call me Airport City. I think we've covered most of the things in this slide. Uh, KYC Global Pass is a, another business entity. When people are doing businesses internationally, WorldGate is a banking facility. So that covers me. But simply, I have to have water. And the countries that I'm not doing business in that have relationships, I have relationships with, they have to have water too. It's just being practical. In order to grow crops, have business, a healthy population so you can actually do something, you have to have fresh water. And I found Genesis as a possible solution, and I haven't found one better. So. Thank you, George. <clears throat> and next, uh, we will hear from uh, Ted Kellerman. Hello, everyone. Um, I, I'm a man who wears a few hats, uh, similar to George. Uh, and the resume that you heard read by David earlier was my, my role at Newmark, uh, where I'm a managing director there. Uh, and I advise clients um, all across the spectrum on real estate. Uh, and my other, the other hat that I wear uh, is where I get to be the client uh, at Eight Points Asset Management, uh, where it's our family's office as well as uh, a new, numerous other families as well that we advise on uh, and invest with uh, their assets in New York, Atlanta, Maryland, Germany, uh, and soon uh, the Philippines. Now, what does real estate have to do with water? Uh, until about five years ago, I didn't think anything. Uh, However, in the last few years, we've been deploying a number of a, a pretty significant amount of capital 
um, into real estate projects. Uh, the most interesting ones that we found are life science projects. Life science, which as, a, as an asset, the real difference between that and a typical office building is just building water risers. Water risers because they need more water. Um, as the cost of water goes up, so does the real estate. And that's money that does not go into the investor or the landlord's pockets. That was, I wouldn't say a red flag, but that was sort of the first yellow warning light that water costs are rising and certain areas are no longer available. Um, a, few, uh, a few months ago, we were looking at a project in, in Arizona and in Phoenix and we walked away from it, because it which, was, which was very hard to do because it checked every box. You know, growing, growing population, wealthy population, educated population. The building itself was was well managed and well run, excellent tenants. Um, but we do not feel secure in the water security of the entire state. And if that becomes a problem in the future, which we very much anticipate it will, um, then it's not a safe investment. So we walked away from it and said as such. So we now look at investments. We've always looked at investments with, you know, we need to find a hundred reasons to say no first. Um, and now water has made that list and it's very close to the top. So um, that is why we're here. And that's why we want to hear all of your ideas and, and collaborate on finding solutions um, like Genesis. So thank you. Thanks, Ted. And next to go is uh, Dr. Thorsten. I have one. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Rich Thorsten, uh, Chief Insights Officer at Water.org. Uh, I've been with the organization for over 15 years now. Um, thanks so much for the invitation to participate today. Uh, David overviewed um, the water scarcity uh, issue that we're facing increasingly in the world. Um, and I would just second that by saying that we also face the scarcity of investment in water supply and sanitation. Um, we are making progress toward uh, sustainable development goal number six. Um, and we have seen examples of effective public, private, and civic partnerships um, that are promising and in some cases starting to go to scale. But the world is not on track uh, to achieve SDG 6 uh, by 2030. Uh, and uh, the increasing looming um, threats and impacts of climate change make it even less likely that that's going to happen um, anytime soon. Uh, so it puts us all at greater risk. And when I talk about risk, we, we, we think about risk in a variety of different ways. Uh, but it's important to remember that those who are at greatest risk are the ones that don't have access to water and sanitation today. So there are over 2 billion people that lack access to safely managed water services, uh, somewhere between three and a half to 4 billion that lack access to safely managed sanitation. Uh, those people tend to be ones that are living in poverty. And they are also paradoxically the ones that are probably going to be most affected by climate change as well. Um, we need a new era of water investment. Um, the current estimates would suggest that uh, we need about $114 billion of total investment per year uh, to meet SDG 6. Um, that's more than three times what the world is currently investing in water supply and sanitation. Uh, that also does not include operational investments. That's only capital investments. And um, it doesn't include the effects of climate change. So we need a lot more resources to come into the sector. Water.org is a charity, um, but we like to, we like to say that um, charity alone will never solve the water and sanitation crisis of this magnitude. Public investment is critical, um, but uh, it's also limited and it's also hotly contested. Uh, let's keep in mind there are 17 sustainable development goals, all of which are looking for public sector investment. So that leaves the private sector. And currently today, the private sector cumulatively invests somewhere between 20 and 25% of the total amount of investment that's needed. So there's a lot more resources that need to come in from the private sector. Uh, 
We also need new approaches and new ways to crowd in that investment. Um, and that's something that water.org and our sister organization, Water Equity, which is an asset manager that's focused on water and sanitation, uh, that's what we do every day. Uh, so uh, our work um, with uh, water credit, which is effectively microfinance for water supply and sanitation and other approaches um, has cumulatively uh, mobilized over $4 billion in capital uh, from markets um, and financial institutions. And we've transformed over 50 million lives. Um, so we're very proud of that, but we know that there's uh, much more work to be done in that regard. Um, this area is uh, water supply and sanitation investment. It's not without risk uh, and it's not without a lot of questions. Um, but if, 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 there weren't a, if there wasn't any risk and there weren't any questions, we probably wouldn't be sitting here today. Um, but um, I want to issue a, a friendly challenge for, uh, for the companies that are out there um, and those that are listening online. Uh, if an organization of water.org size last year, I think we had somewhere between 35 and $38 million in revenue, can achieve the type of impact that we have collectively, um, think of what some of the leading companies um, that are listening today and the leading companies on the NASDAQ would be capable of doing if they leaned into investment in water supply and sanitation. Um, companies are already recognizing that there are risks associated with not investing, risks to their shareholders, risks to their suppliers, risks to their customers, uh, licensed to operate in some markets, even the planet. Um, there are a variety of risks that companies are already facing by doing nothing. So the real thoroughbreds um, at the end of the day over the next five to 10 years are those that are going to be willing to invest in spite of those risks, or in some cases because of those risks, um, to look for the bankable deals and the opportunities to create greater investment and new impact in the world. Um, we are fortunate to be working with a, a handful of those companies. We, uh, some of those announced um, some terrific uh, commitments this week um, here at the UN Water Conference, and we look forward to seeing many more at the table in the years ahead. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. And John, over to you. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm uh, John Matthews I'm with Agua, the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation. We're uh, an organization that our focus uh, for the last 13 years is to talk uh, about not just the risks around water and climate change, but also to talk about them, uh, about, about the, the synergies, the opportunities, and really to try to operationalize our, our responses to uh, 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 ongoing climate change. What, what do some of those look like? Uh, about a year ago, I was in Edinburgh uh, in Scotland uh, at, a, uh, at, a, at a business meeting uh, that was focused on water. And uh, I had just given a talk about uh, some of the trends that were happening in water and climate, not unlike a, a David's initial uh, presentation. And a colleague from a, a US tech firm came up to me uh, afterwards and, and she said, uh, our, our firm is, uh, it was really concerned about the supply chain issues that happened in Taiwan over the drought uh, with, uh, with uh, semiconductors. So uh, I'm curious, John, what, what do you think? We're, we're uh, considering building a, a huge new uh, uh, a plant in, the, uh, in Arizona um, uh, to help uh, balance that. Uh, and I, I thought about it uh, for a minute. I thought, you know, uh, we don't get any money from them. I'm gonna say what I think. <laughs> I said, if, if you're gonna you're gonna put some, uh, a, a plant that has such intense water requirements, especially water purity requirements, uh, uh, to be able to build a plant there, why don't you introduce migratory salmon to Arizona as well? Uh, uh, she was really quiet for a minute, but then she laughed and she said, "Yeah, I thought it was a pretty stupid idea too." But th that's the the idea here. I think is is not just uh, David had a fantastic point too. Uh, in his slides, he said water is present in all parts of our economy. One of the big problems, though, is that we don't see where that water is. Water is in this electricity. It's in our data. So the the the, the challenge that we have is 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 to really be able to see uh, wh where uh, we need to be able to manage. And 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 in the concept of resilience, one of the key ideas to me is how we transition from an economic way of thinking that's focused on efficiency to uh, uh, bringing resilience uh, into the language of economics. M what does that look like? What is the difference between efficiency and resilience? M my uh, best example comes from 
very uh, early in the last uh, US administration. We had huge warehouses that were uh, uh, stationed around the country that were full of N95 masks and, and ventilators. That they, they were owned by the federal government for pandemic conditions and they were liquidated just months before COVID began. Uh, uh, it was an incredibly efficient decision to get rid of those. The, the federal government probably showed a profit on getting rid of them, but it was not a resilient decision. And that's the kind of transition that we need to move towards. And we need to really be able to operationalize that within businesses, within sectors and across uh, borders. Thank you. Thank you. And next is Paresh. Um, good morning. So, David, thank you for including us. This is uh, it's a privilege to be here um, among the distinguished guests here. Um, it's kind of humbling for me to actually sitting here in front of you and speak about water um, and, and why am I here. Uh, journey started, you know, born in, in, in a family where water was actually insecurity. There was barely any water available. Uh, if there was any water, it was contaminated or, or you get sick all the time. So that was the life beginning. And then fortunate enough to, you know, migrate into the country here and which is, you know, provided me a, a substantial opportunities to, to make something, build a couple of businesses and stuff. You know, tech is my background, which I love building companies. And, and eventually the goal here was at some day, I want to actually do something for the water scarcity because people who lived in it is actually tremendous, tremendous stress. They don't realize, we don't realize it because we open a tap here and we get a fresh water. A lot of in the country, you know, people in the world don't have those privileges, right? It's water should be a right, not a privilege, right? So then the journey led me to say, eventually build enough companies and resources to say, I want to do something about the water. And then this is when I was invited to um, join um, XPRIZE by Pierre Diamond. This an XPRIZE foundation I love about it. We actually take a look at the grand challenges and say, how do we solve this challenge? And the way we look at it, at least I would love to look at it as well, because you know I may have a solution, but there are entrepreneurs in the world actually have better solutions. So what's the best way to actually crowdsource the entire innovation to solve a grand challenge, which is actually missed by a market or people haven't solved it. So what we do, we go study. So that's exactly what we did. I went around the you know, world, looked at all parts of the world and went out and said, what is the water? What What is an actual issue? What can we solve in water? Because you know you can, approach many different ways in water, whether it's a, you know, cleaning water or, you know, do sustainable, actually tap into the water or, or actually, you know, sorts of how do you create water? There's no water available. So the, what I went around the world and found that parts of the world don't even have actually water. How do you actually generate water from it? Eventually we came up with, I said, well, let's tap into the largest reservoir of the, you know, fresh water would be atmosphere. So, we put a price together, say, hey, like what we actually do, what breakthrough do we require to make this reality? So we, let, we uh, study this entire thing rigorously and figure out, simply simplify it. What if we actually like, you know, launch a challenge to say, if you extract water from the atmosphere or from thin air, 2000 liters per day at a cost of two cents or less. Mind you, it's a very simple goal, but it's a very you know, hard to achieve in a breakthrough. So if you do achieve it, you do start an impact-based um, world where you can actually provide water to resources that actually have zero access to safe drinking water. Because we all know, I mean, we heard all the statistics you know, around the world, 50% of the you know, beds in developing countries are occupied by waterborne disease. I mean, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people actually die from it. We know that, I mean, billions of people actually currently have water, which is, I hate to say it, but actually is contaminated with feces. So how do you actually make this Problem. So then we took the audacious goal, launched a prize. 70 uh, teams around the world from 46 countries actually participated to challenge this all. And then there was a team who actually proved that you can actually do extract the water from thin air at a two cents or less per water and not using grid energy. And then that team actually we awarded, as you can see here, was awarded a prize. So here's where the impact can happen. So for me, having an impact on the people who really need a fresh water or drink the safe drinking water, it actually happened. But water goes beyond, right? You know, water also has a larger issue, geopolitical, right? If we don't solve it, yes, we can actually always help people actually what's needs of water needed. But if we don't solve this problem today, it's gonna get worse, right? If their country is already suffering from water. We actually heard facts this week all over 
but how crazy it is getting to the certain part of the world. People get desperate. In those situations, when countries get desperate, they will actually use this as a weapon, you know, whether they have the access or don't have the access. Either way, or somebody's going to be rebellious or somebody's going to try to save it. There are rivers actually getting contaminated in part of South America that actually by illegal mining flows into the next country. And that country, people are dying daily and cancers and, and other stuff because it's water so contaminated and that's all choices they have. So what do we do, right? So we, the reason what I would love to the passion in the business community is that there's extraordinary problems, you know, entrepreneurs look at it as an extraordinary opportunities, right? Those requires investment. You could actually do, you know, while well by doing good. So this is the area that I believe it's actually ignored by largely you know, and the water's not going to go, this is not going to go away. This problem is going to get worse if you don't act on it. We re require a tremendous amount of innovation. There are innovations happening, right? But they all require capital, all requires an investment, a collective effort to go and actually support them and actually make, do a ball with it too. And to business community, if it's an ROI matter, shareholders matters, of course, you know, it matters. And I don't think anything if it's not sustainable, it works. So this is one of the area, I think there's a great opportunity for investment, innovations, um, and we're taking water at the all, from, uh, all front. We're actually about to launch a prize to disrupt the entire desalination program. Currently the desal desalination happens to, it's affordable to only rich countries, people who can afford it. It's a very, very expensive capital intensive industry, right? But there are countries in the world who actually has no uh, shorelines they could use ocean water to actually desal but they cannot afford it today there's no dollar amount we want to disrupt that we want to make it as make environmentally sustainable as well so we're about to launch a very ambitious large prize to actually disrupt the desalination to challenge the world to say we have to actually do a exponential way of innovation not a linear you know because i don't think we have time to do linear improvements we have to do moonshotty way of doing it yeah so i'm excited Thanks, Prish. And this is what I say, right? I always say investment matters, right? This is where you want to, this is, we're not talking about, like I said, chicken shit, like chicken little. We're really talking about a real problem. So I'm not an activist here, right? I'm literally talking about, we got to go out. We need money. These are the facts. This is, yeah. Thank you. Okay, next. Um... Spot on. Next, uh, we'll hear from Jay Heller. So, it's a pleasure to be here. I have to tell you, I'm uh, I'm floored. I, I feel it's a privilege and a pleasure to be here today. And you probably think, what is NASDAQ that lists, you know, companies from around the globe? What do they have to do with the environment? And let alone, what do they have to do with water? Uh, and the answer is a lot. I think it's all about really the understanding of who we as NASDAQ is today, where we were and where we're going. Uh, we do have the largest companies in the world listed on our exchange, the Apples, the Amazons, the Teslas, right? Those that change the way people live their lives. But it's such a small part, and it really is. It's just a small part of who we are. We are a diverse company that focuses on technology, that believes in capital formation. And we also bring together, we feel, we're the global marketplace, for everybody that has a vested interest in anything around the world to deploy capital, we, we really do play a large part you know, of that. One out of every 10 transactions around the world happens on a NASDAQ platform. You may or may not know that our technology powers 130 different exchanges around the globe. And so what does it all mean? And what do we do with that? Well, it's our job to have the integrity of the markets. And that brings us reference before capital formation for any great company, such as a Genesis for not only yesterday, not only today, but for the future. And then we talk about protecting, or, uh, protecting investors, uh, we've made strategic investments and acquisitions in the anti-financial crime network, right? When people do deploy capital, it's our job to protect that. Now it's easy to say that we care and care about the environment and we care about water, but I think it's even greater when you kind of put your money where your mouth is. And so we as NASDAQ, we've made strategic investments and we've deployed capital and ESNG, uh, look at Metrio, a recent acquisition. There's data out there. I'm a corporate, private or public. What do I do with it? How do I gather it? And how do I tell my story? There's one report. We have this information. Now, how do we get it to all the reporting agencies? So how do we truly define who we are today and where we'll be tomorrow? 
And then also our services, right? It's all about, we have a story to tell and how do we partner with a corporate and then how do we position them for success in the future with everything in which we do. And then when it comes to water, you may or may not know, we do have an exchange and we have an index, I should say. It's the, U, it's the NASDAQ OMX water index. And we also have the world's largest ETF that actually trades earmarked to water on our exchange. And so there's a lot we'll talk about a little bit later on, but just know when you think about who we are being at the forefront and the center of everything which we're doing, we as NASDAQ, we wanna play a vital part because we do believe that today's children are tomorrow's future and that's gonna change everyone's lives. That's it. Thank you, Jay. All right, next we'll hear from Timothy. Good morning. I would like to thank you all for this opportunity to present my comparatively novice perspective on the crisis of our global water supply. This perspective is what the UN Secretary General has asked of youth from around the world participating in these conference activities. He wanted us to share our views on what is in front of a young generation and the challenges arriving from lack of water are gigantic. We have established this morning that this is a historic opportunity for humanity. And I am thankful that you are not at a movie or the opening of a Broadway play today. We need you here. I believe today, I believe you are here today because change is important to you. And for that, I am grateful. We need your help to implement some changes very quickly. It is all our responsibility. No single person can stop the advancement of global water scarcity but together we can create a lasting movement. But we must follow through on what we started. Allow me to share something the world has already agreed on to illustrate not only the need for change, but the need for committed follow through. The attention of the global community was directed for the need for immediate action to avoid a rapidly increasing water crisis and find ways in which the earth's fixed water stock could be used most wisely and efficiently. The conference formulated an international consensus on a number of policy and operational measures. Surprisingly, free from continuous debate in spite of such controversial issues as the sharing of water resources of international river, river basins and the immobilization of financial resources to cover the almost gigantic cost involved if we were to reach the goals set up by the conference. Safe water for every individual. This is not a conference agreement that reached consensus during this week in New York City, but it was rather reached at the last UN conference in March 1977. This agreement was reached 46 years ago. We made commitments then, but we did not follow through. For almost 50 years, we did not follow through. We are now in a very different situation than we were in 1977. We are, according to some, less than 20 years from day zero. It's called water bankruptcy. While this future is troubling, I take some hope in the ability of humanity to develop breakthrough technologies to solve these kinds of issues. The challenge now, because I have seen some of those technologies, is that we need to get substantial backing behind them. We need to create an ecosystem that thrives around water investments, much like the up and coming civil space industry. It is time for water and we do not have decades to get it done. I am excited about this conference and I am encouraged that the, UN is, that the UN established as one of the priorities of this conference, speaking about how to connect finance, investment, and other resources to this effort. Because no matter how good the champion, I can tell you as a baseball coach, there can be no wins without the support, structure, and team behind you. We have got to build that team. And I believe that this meeting will be a catalyst for the forming of the team and the effort that will take this issue in hand. Thank you. Thank you, Timothy. And Minister Goldsmith. Sorry, was it working? Thank you, thank you very much indeed. Um, I should start by saying your very long introduction of me 
makes me sound much more important than I actually am. Um, I'm really glad you're here. Very I'm just a, a, a political cockroach who's survived endless prime ministers over the last couple of years, and somehow I'm still hanging in there. Um, look, we, we are... Um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm going to try not to say anything that's already been said other than to make the obvious point that water matters. Water is essential for absolutely everything we are, every single thing we do, and yet that is not reflected in the decisions we make. It's not reflected in the manner in which we look after natural systems. Our rivers are often little more than trash cans. Um, we are um, subjecting millions of people around the world to poisonous, contaminated water. So we know that this stuff matters, and we know that our current relationship with water is entirely uh, abusive. Now, I think things are beginning to change. This conference now is 50 years too late, but nevertheless, it's happening. Um, we've heard some incredible uh, remarks from the panel already today. I understand, it may be out of date, but I understand at least by, by lunchtime yesterday, there were 300 new commitments that had been made by businesses, by governments, including the UK government. So stuff is beginning to happen. But if there's one thing that I would like to emphasize and, and really will continue to champion for as long as I'm able to, it is the need for a broader focus because almost all of the work that is done on water is around gray infrastructure, cleaning up contaminated water, building concrete defenses, uh, you know, accommodating ever increasing floods and so on. But there is no substitute for nature. Uh, it, water is provided to us by nature. It is complex natural systems that give us what we need. And for as long as we continue to degrade uh, and despoil those natural systems, it doesn't matter how many wells we dig. It doesn't matter how much concrete defense we put up. We are going to be fighting a losing battle. So it is essential that nature is front and center when we approach water. Despite that, and but I'll give you one example, actually, for anyone who's, who, who disputes that or doubts that. It's estimated that the Congo Basin uh, provides anything up to two thirds of all the water, all the rainfall uh, in the continent of Africa. And yet the Congo Basin is being wiped out at a rate of around half a million hectares every year. So it's almost impossible to imagine the scale of the humanitarian disaster that would occur were those trends to continue, were we to fail to help those countries to protect the Congo Basin. And there are similar examples all around the world. So nature really does matter. But despite all of that, only 1% of total investment into water goes into nature-based solutions. And that has got to shift. Um, in, and that's, I guess, if I have one pitch, um, and, I, and I think the UK as a government um, has, has absorbed that message. I think it was reflected in the work we did at COP26. Uh, I know a number of you were there, where we brought nature from the margins of the discussion, put it right in the heart of the discussions and debates around climate change. We secured huge commitments on forest preservation. 90% um, of the world's forests covered by those commitments. Um, we saw just a few weeks ago, the agreement reached in Montreal, the global biodiversity framework. And then a few years ago, we obviously had the Paris commitment, which commits us to one and a half degrees. We have the global agreements. They're all there now. We, it's not about macro politics. It's now, really about making stuff happen. And the governments have a unique role. There are certain things that only government can do. We write the rules, we set the parameters, and governments need to be encouraged to do exactly that. But governments are terrified of regulating business. So my plea to business is be brave, send signals to the regulators, to governments, that you want regulatory clarity. And the more pressure that governments hear from business, the more likely it is they'll have the courage to provide that kind of regulatory and legal clarity that we know we need. And the second thing is business, that we are going to find ourselves at a point where every decision taken by businesses, whatever sector you're in, 
is a decision that is taken in alignment with one and a half degrees and in alignment with the global biodiversity framework that we signed up to, the world signed up to just a few weeks ago. So that is gonna happen. And there are front runners already grappling with this and doing incredible things. And there are laggards who are delaying for as long as they can, but it is gonna happen. So my plea to business is be the front runner and help with those laggards to see that it's not that frightening after all. And they'll stop at that point. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. All right. Uh, well, this comes to the next part of the uh, program today, which is uh, where I've asked the things get lively, um, the volley. And uh, so we're going to ask questions now. We're going to bat it back and forth. Uh, there'll be two bits to this. So I'm going to ask some questions initially uh, from each of our panelists, and then they're going to ask questions from each other. Uh, and they'll have about five minutes to do that. So with that, um, uh, I'm going to begin with George. Uh, this morning uh, for our questions, George, you're in the hot seat. Um, you're a seasoned global developer and you have been uh, key in standing up some of the most notable free trade zones in the world. As you position for the future of development, you have said that water is top of your mind. Talk to me about some of the challenges that you're facing out in the field as you develop free trade zones. Why, why is water pinched? We've been taking groundwater out of the ground and exiting it to the sea since the beginning of time. And we just can't do it anymore. Uh, in order to have a sustainable economy or a sustainable city, I have to have water. So I look at practical solutions that are financially viable that I can finance in conventional markets. But I need to open those markets up a little bit more because it's limited and it's very limited in underdeveloped countries uh, to do a bond there and float a bond without a capital market or a financial guarantee from a government. It gets to be pretty cumbersome and to do off take agreements with their uh, water companies. That's cumbersome, too, because that won't float the boat for the financing. So we've found some pretty interesting ways in different parts of the world to do things to accomplish the goal. But I'd really like to have a global solution so, so that I don't have to reinvent the wheel for every country. So. All right, my next question is much faster. Uh, this one you should be able to uh, uh, knock out quickly. As you establish new locations and prepare uh, large real estate transactions, based on what was going on 10, even five years ago, where does water now rank in your list of priorities? It's ranking higher and higher because the developed countries that can supply water, I've run through a bunch of those and, and uh, different projects. So now um, into sort of the hinderlands and the hinderlands are the ones that had the problems in the first place. That's why they're the hinderlands. Africa today, for an example, you mentioned the Congo. Botswana is very arid, the number one economy in sub-Saharan Africa. Just south, South Africa, we're talking about the water shortage there. Financing things, in, unless it's in Botswana, a little bit South Africa, very difficult. Certainly the Congo, very difficult. So part of part and parcel of having water security is also uh, helping a country get the security of their government, their land ownership, and, and, and. So, uh, but water's right up there. You can't do anything without it. Okay. So you wouldn't quantify it for me, but uh, is it a top five? Is it a top three? It's certainly the top three. Okay. It's something that's not that easy to cure. Okay. My final question for you, George, today is uh, how can developers and markets begin to account for the potential disruptions that are becoming the hallmark of a water-scarce world? What has to be done? That's simple. We can't wait and, and be reactive. We have to be proactive 
and plan for things that probably are going to happen. Um, and it doesn't, we can't do the water solve situation overnight. It has to be properly the seven P's, six P's. Prior proper planning prevents poor performance. And that's what we have to do. Not only here domestically in the United States, Britain, the UK, every developed nation in order to protect our homeland security, if you will, needs to look at this and really look at it seriously now. Here, we just had some chemical spills in our major waterways. Now, it, there, what has happened was very serious, but it wasn't crippling. Something crippling could happen, and then we're, how do you fix it? You have to have a plan, and you have to have implemented that plan in advance to have the security. That? Thank you. Okay, uh, next in a volley here, we're gonna move to uh, Ted. And uh, Ted, if you'll get the mic to the left. Um, I wanna ask you as a, as a young global leader in developments, uh, you've been involved in leading sizable transactions across the globe from Europe to Southeast Asia. So as we're looking to create a sustainable future, um, how do you think in your experience, uh, technology will begin to shape these, these uh, projects? Uh, describe some of the innovations that you're excited about so we can understand how they will flow into uh, economies of scale or large developments as uh, there's population increases. Sure, immensely. Um, and it's not just within the scope of water, but sustainability in, at, at large. Um, about five or six years ago, Newmark as a whole started focusing its research on sustainability and things like that. Um, but innovation is necessary. Um, sort of, you, you're, you are an academic, so you understand the concept of publish or perish. It's very much the same concept here. Um, if we don't innovate, it will turn into a desert. So um, some of the innovations that we see that are, that are exciting um, are, you know, uh, there are some modular um, housing, or not housing, but modular construction technologies that we think, think are very fascinating that remove the entire use of concrete, which by the way is very water intensive to begin with. Um, and it also builds faster and are safer buildings um, uh, in terms of earthquakes. They can withstand up to um, uh, nine Richter scale uh, earthquakes. Um, obviously the, the atmospheric water generation companies that we see like Genesis um, that produce water uh, out of thin air, literally, are, are, are going to be vital to, to this. Um, but on top of that, uh, some of the more less obvious things like data, water data, um, and understanding, understanding water data and building the data sets to create insights into where it's needed, what is wrong with it, how to fix it. Um, right now, we're, it's in its infancy, if it even exists at all, beyond, you know, just basic observation. Um, so those are gonna be very important things to, to explore further. Um, and that's not just for real estate, that's just, that's for um, society at large. So I hope that's, that's so helpful. The ecosystem's coming together right now. And so let me ask in terms of projects that you've been involved with, using those as kind of a, a case study to extrapolate. Um, if, if, if these changes, that are on the horizon or that are incubating now in terms of technologies and, and, and differences of how we apply those technologies are not made. <clears throat> what, what do you see uh, occurring in terms of the bottom line? Well, right now it's recovering the bottom line. Costs are rising and we're trying to recover that, that lost profit. Um, but as the innovation continues, the point is to, to create greater efficiencies you know, and greater opportunity and lower costs for the consumer and increased profits for the investor. Um, and, and we actively see that being possible um, it, because this is, this, is, <laughs> this is not a matter of survival, it's a matter of thriving. Um, it, every decade should be better than the last. So, so why should this be any different? I like it. We need to thrive. In your opinion, how should markets posture to embrace the authentic changes, uh, obviously not, not greenwashing and all of the things that have been talked about, but um, how, how can we take action in a water action decade? How do we get the powder behind the ball? So, so I'm a capitalist and 
I don't think we tell the markets to do anything. The markets will do what they always do. They observe, they learn, they invest. They push their capital behind the winners. Um, the ones, the onus lies on the innovative, the innovators, the inno innovations. Um, it's their job to, you know, build the right teams and and build the right product, uh, and and get it out to the market so that the market can make can do what they do best and put their capital behind, uh, you know, the winning horses. I like it. We'll let the markets work. Okay. See the water tower. Sure do. Looking right at it. Right, right. Hey, if you all turn around, just look out the window. Every building here in New York City has their own water capacity at the top elevation of the building. That water comes into the ground level and is pumped up, and then the gravity flows and provides the feed for the building. Very, very energy intensive. Genesis smaller systems could be right on the top of buildings. So you don't have to pump it. In islands, desalinization, if you don't have to pump it out of the sea and then pump it to where it's going, if you can put it on top of a mountain and gravity feed it, you saved a lot of money and became very practical. But I wanted everybody at some point to think about the water towers and it's staring me in the face. <laughs> A lot of potential energy. Thousands and thousands of buildings. How many buildings? All right. Thanks, Ted. I appreciate the comments there. And next, we're going to go to uh, Dr. Thorsten. Um, so you're in the hot seat now. Um, sir, you're known for your disruptive thinking and leadership at one of the most prolific water finance organizations uh, in the U.S. And I'd like to know what do investors need to know right now? What do they need to understand in the water action decade? What is the kernel of knowledge that each has to take away from today? So first of all, I would say that um, I think that there is greater opportunities for investment, greater interest in investment in water and sanitation than, than there has been in a very long time. Um, I think that uh, development financial institutions and impact investors like water equity are developing pipeline, are seeking opportunities to uh, place the capital to be that downstream conduit for that upstream capital to flow. Um, that's the first thing. Um, you know, secondly, when we think about infrastructure and we think about projects, um, infrastructure in some respects in the wash space is no different from infrastructure in other sectors. Uh, it requires significant um, financing up front. And it takes a long time to create those opportunities, to um, secure the capital, to deploy that capital, to construct and operate the facilities so that that capital can be returned uh, with, with interest um, over time. Uh, done well, it can provide stable, predictable returns um, on investment. Um, in, in the water space, um, there probably will be some degree of concessionary capital that's required. So I think you're going to hear a lot more about blended finance um, over the next five to 10 years. Um, uh, the, the concessional piece helps build the pipeline and helps de-risk uh, the investments um, that are needed for the long term um, on the infrastructure side. I think on the company side, um, I think we're seeing more and more companies, uh, us and Water Equity are seeing more and more companies uh, emerge in the space um, uh, that are eligible and interested in investment. Um, I think for equity investors, uh, you know, they are potentially looking at uh, shorter term horizons than uh, uh, project based investment uh, and uh, looking to secure their, their principal along with returns sooner rather than later. Uh, that, however, does carry some risks um, as there often isn't the degree of co funding and uh, the opportunities for concessionary capital to come in with equity investments. So, those are a few things that we're seeing in the market. Thank you. All right. Um, in 20, uh, 2011 through 2020, the World uh, Economic Forum ranked water as a top five disruptive trend to the world's economy. What, in your view, is the role of finance and investment in forestalling and preventing economic catastrophe globally? What happens if this doesn't get done? Uh, so, um, you know, thinking about economic catastrophe. I'm going to go back to one of the points that I made in my opening remarks, which is 
there are billions of people that are living every day in a world of economic catastrophe because they don't have access to safe water and sanitation. And climate change is going to make them more vulnerable over time. So they're already paying for that in terms of lost wages, time. Uh, often they're paying more for water uh, than uh, their wealthier counterparts are, uh, and a variety of other ways. Um, so we're dealing with that crisis today. Um, and that's often not talked about in, um, in, in certain um, parts of the, the water and sanitation conversations. Um, longer term, I think from a longer term infrastructure perspective, we will need to invest more in infrastructure. Of, and and uh, as, as uh, Lord Goldsmith mentioned, nature-based solutions around the world, everywhere, including in advanced industrialized economies um, as well. There's no getting around that. Um, we are getting out of whack in terms of uh, demand versus um, available supply, and we need to address that. Um, and I would say that you know climate change is, is sort of like a sort of like a slow moving tsunami. We we can see it happening, um, and increasingly, um, the the more we do to invest in that today and the preventative measures uh, to mitigate those effects, the better we will be. Because when day if and when day zero hits, as we talked about in Cape Town and other parts of the world, um, by then it's too late. And so we need to make those investments now to prepare for a more climate resilient world in the future. Thank you. And next we'll go to John. And uh, so, you know, you are an authority on the use and adaptation of uh, water. Uh, so as humanity uses many of the same technologies that it has used since antiquity, uh, aqueducts come to mind, um, for example. But as water sources are running out in, t in terms of the source waters, uh, as challenges like this present to the water supply today, what are the adaptations we need to make now and what in your role will be the, 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 the marketplace in making that, ad, ad, that ad, adaptation happen uh, at the pace it needs to happen at? Um, that, I, I think that's a fantastic point, the way you frame the question. You know, wh wh what's the role of technology and innovation as, as well as investment? And um, I, I'd like to uh, follow up on, on both Richard and Lord Goldsmith's comments. Uh, that actually uh, nature-based solutions, they, 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 they may be quite ancient, uh, 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 but I, they actually, I think we're finding them in a really new way. I'll give you a really quick example. There's a risk methodology, uh, climate risk methodology uh, that we co-developed with the uh, US Army Corps of Engineers, with Del Taurus, uh, in the Netherlands, with UNESCO, uh, a, a few other groups uh, that was adopted uh, by the state of California about three or four years ago. And uh, it, it's uh, this is this is also uh, goes to the difference between uh, de-risking and resilience. They uh, they step back. They said, you know, we for for essentially uh, all of California's history, it stored water primarily not behind dams but in snowpack. It's up in the Sierra Nevada, and they they they've been losing that uh, uh, quite steadily. The, it's the slow-moving tsunami that's followed by an infinite number of other tsunamis, um, but they're, 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 they're losing that snowpack. So they're having drier summers, but the other part of it is not just increasing water scarcity in the summer, it's actually intensifying floods in the winter because precipitation is still coming down. It's just coming down as rain and, and, and really intense rain events during the winter. So they're having in the same basins, worse floods and, and worse droughts in the same year. Their insight was, Actually, those are not two separate problems. They are the same problem. And, and they, uh, they developed what I think is, a, is a, actually a profoundly elegant solution. They said, let's take the floodwaters in winter. Let's push them into farmers' fields. We'll push them into meadows, into orchards, into vineyards. And let the water sit. Uh, and what it does there is it's infiltrating. It actually is recharging the groundwater. So it, it's gone from one nature-based solution of snowpack for water storage to a second uh, uh, nature-based solution of groundwater. And actually, the, it's been so successful in California that Governor Newsom recently announced, I think it was last August, that not, not only should the state of California de-risk from climate change, they, we need to find new sources of water. And they weren't talking about desal. They were talking about these groundwater recharge mechanisms. And they've gone from working in one or two basins to working in something like 17 uh, uh, counties across the state, a huge part of the state. And they see that increasing about 40% of California's water overall. I, I uh, connected that team 
to the World Bank. The World Bank has been taking this, this idea to South Asia. It's been taking it to East Africa, places where you also have the same kind of dynamic between snowpack and groundwater. And it's a, it's a deep, powerful insight, and it's a completely sustainable one. It's one that we can invest in. And just as one like uh, final point, uh, you know, we uh, this 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 idea of, of, of innovation it's so powerful. Uh, uh, and but it's often this idea of how we we see old things anew. Um, about four or five years ago, uh, the um, uh, using a, uh, a a green bond. A certification system that we did to be able to communicate to bond issuers and bond investors that uh, that the system had been de-risked uh, in in, in uh, really emergent modern thinking around uh, climate and water, uh, and ideally was a, a deeply resilient project. The the uh, finance ministry in the Netherlands uh, issued a, a green bond for a massive uh, nature-based solution, five billion euros. One, one, one bond, five billion euros to actually capture floodwaters, move it into uh, into wetlands, uh, and and uh, uh, and move move it away from uh, uh, habit, uh, inhabited areas, uh, uh, and uh, and and actually recharge and restore these ecosystems. This this uh, bond it it sold out. It was oversubscribed by a factor of seven uh, the first day. Uh, <laughs> So five billion euros. They 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 came in with twenty seven billion euros in, in pledges. This is really powerful, uh, and and it's something that I think we 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 can easily scale up and accelerate. Thank you. And uh, next we're going to go to Paresh. And as for the um, fellows up here, uh, we are missing a couple of the ladies who were not able to make it. Um, and um, so uh, we know that they're here with us in spirit and uh, also watching uh, online. Uh, so Paresh, I want to go to you for a moment. Uh, you know, you've been leading water innovation competitions globally for some time now, um, about a decade. What is the central issue you're trying to solve? And what happens if we don't make those investments uh, in, in, in those right things? Well, thank, thank you, Dave. Um, you know, um, the idea, like I said, it, it growing up with knowing the water, not having access to water or safe drinking water is, was resonated a lot with me in my heart and the families around and stuff. So it, it kind of, you felt the problem to begin with, right? So you can see there are millions or hundreds of millions of other ones also feels the same way. So for me, it was a personal to actually start and see if I can solve this, you know? So that led me to actually run this sort of prizes. So how do we solve these grand challenges nobody talks about that access to safe drinking water simply? Like I said, I'm gonna repeat again. Water should not be privileged. Water should be a right of every child growing up and everybody, right? So for me, I wanted to solve that. I looked around, surveyed everything. There's many people that actually suffer that. So by challenging the world of those prizes of innovation, that how can we solve something and put an entire global entrepreneurs who actually are passionate about solving the problems, you innovating, like crowdsourcing the innovation to solve a particular problem. What I learned, the reason I wanted to do passionately do it, because parts of the world, for example, if you don't have safe drinking water accessible, you know, people who suffer the most are female, right? Ladies and girls actually have to are the most directly related to not having access to safe drinking water. Go out and spend two hours to go get the water and come home and support the family. They lose on education, they lose on the growth, they lose on everything. So there's a direct relation to women's safety and water access, right? Things of sort, education, also, they lose two hours a day for education. So those things actually impacts by simply solving the access to safe drinking water. So that passion, that's what led me to go around the world and, and try to solve that. And best way to do it is, unfortunately, I'm not born with hundreds of millions of dollars to support it. Uh, wanted to actually let the entrepreneurs solve it around the world. And they did. And they're doing it like yourself. Genesis is doing it. You know, Genesis is doing what they're doing, you know, extracting the water from the air and actually make it available to people which there is no water. So admire the innovations like these. And I think these are the things are going to actually have a larger impact. Sometime back, uh, you and I did a podcast and you framed out three things I thought were very interesting. And um, I'm going to try to keep us on time. So if you could uh, answer just quickly, you just did a global uh, tour and you said that you really identified three things that are going to really move the needle in terms of sustainable water. Can you talk about each of those quickly? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I, the way I like to do it because I travel around the world and you know, for water, educate myself. You know, what are the countries facing? Because we actually know water is a problem, but each country or each region actually has a different water issue. I mean, we can sit here and again address we have this water issue because we actually turn the tap on and water comes right. But there are each country actually has their own sort of each region actually has their own challenges. So by traveling the world, I I noticed. Uh, there's not a one solution, for example, extracting water from thin and air. It was, that's not the, the solution. There's a multiple way to actually, we're gonna have to attack this. One of them is abs absolutely tap into the atmospheric water, which will address an issue where there is no access to water, which actually, you know, sometimes there is none. For countries like Jordan, for example, they don't have any other resources, but to actually, so solutions like this would actually tremendously help them, right? A lot of countries are actually surrounded by oceans, but they actually have still have you know, no water. So while desal, desalination of actually tapping into that water might work, but the same problem is currently the way desalination is done is disaster, you know, and environmentally disaster. Actually, you know, also people with rich countries only can afford it. So that industry also needs to be disruptive and actually make it available. Can we actually take the ocean water in a sustainable manner and make it available to the countries, our smaller countries around the world, which I think we can. We just haven't given the opportunity to the world entrepreneurs and challenge them, which we're about to do. And third is actually water that we actually have. We're using it. How can we reuse it maybe five, six times before we actually discard it? There's there's a tremendous technology innovation should be happening and it's happening. But the, for now, they're expensive. We need to actually get to a point that we can do it a sustainable way. So, you know, um, recycling the water and reusing it, um, tapping into the ocean water and actually atmospheric water. I think we need to do that in order to actually solve the larger problem. Thanks for those insights. All right, Jay, uh, you're up in the hot seat now. Um, and, uh, you know, we can ask you the hard questions, right? Because uh, we're, in, we're in your world. Um, you know, as a leader here at NASDAQ, uh, this is arguably one of the most pro prolific and one of the largest security exchanges in the world. Um, you know, I, I'd like you to describe for us what you believe is unfolding in terms of market opportunities and trends in water. Having um, read the headlines this this week, certainly some interesting information has bumped to the top. But what's what's the contours here? I would say from here we go. I, I would say from an investable standpoint, you know, you're you're hearing about the infrastructure, you're hearing about the municipalities, but let's just put it to into perspective, right? Uh, in 2021, just from a high level. On NASDAQ, we had over 750 IPOs. Those are corporates around the world raising primary capital to fund their business, 180 billion. There are various means in which people can invest. Uh, you can invest, choose to invest in a corporate a company that you believe in, or in a basket of some sort, whether it's an index fund or an exchange traded fund. Is it too late? Is it too early? Well, I say it's, we're just at, we're just starting to percolate. So if you look at the ETF industry as a whole, right, exchange traded funds, more comprised of indexes, there is around approximately 9,000 ETFs listed and formatted uh, worldwide, which has about $20 trillion of assets under management, earmark to it. Now, out of those 9,000, there are seven, just seven, that are earmarked to water. Uh, the largest being the Invesco Water Resources ETF, has about 1.75 billion earmarked. That's it. Now let's let's take it a step further. The top five largest ETFs in the world have a combined assets under management of approximately 1.5 trillion out of that 20 trillion worldwide. Out of the seven that are earmarked for water, you have just over four billion dollars. So we're talking, I don't think we're talking apples to apples or apples to oranges. I don't even, maybe it's a grape that got stepped on. So my, my point is we're, we're very early. So if this is truly something that you're passionate, look, we as an investor, we can buy bonds, but it's going to be hard for us, anyone up here to fund any type of infrastructure. So what do we do? We choose the winners or the companies in which we believe in, and we look towards some type of vehicle that's a, a combination of all of them, and that can be an ETF. But we're early. And so you will see incubations here. The fire, as you said, has been set. 
you know, the blaze is starting to occur. And now it's our job, honestly, as NASDAQ to really provide that atmosphere or element to allow people to be able to transact and get accessibility to all these vehicles around the world. So again, I, I think it's very, very early and we're just at the tipping point. Would NASDAQ be the lead? Well, just keep in mind that we as NASDAQ, we have the US or we have the NASDAQ water index already. So we're already at the forefront. And as referenced before, we are a firm believer in everything in the transition, the energy transition and what's taking place. We made a major acquisition or investment. And we are the majority shareholder in a company called Pure Earth, taking carbon out of the environment and having a platform to trade these carbon credits. As referenced before, a very large investment in ESG and how do we position corporates? How do you tell your story and get those right investors to come to you? So I would say we're at the forefront and it's only gonna to continue to get larger and larger and larger. All right, I have a quick follow-up. This is uh, where you get to uh, share opinion, which is important. Oh. You know, are there parallels here to what is happening um, within the marketplace yeah. and other things that have happened in history? And if so, what is the nature of it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, if we talk about being early, you know, Steve Jobs was never Steve Jobs. Well, he was always Steve Jobs, but he wasn't the Steve Jobs of yesteryear, what he was today or what he was. Uh, same thing for Jeff Bezos, same thing for Elon Musk. Um, we are looking for the innovators of today to drive tomorrow. Who's going to change our world? We're using and we leverage here at NASDAQ. And without that, even in the ecosystem, AI, you know, MI, the costs that are coming down in regards to cloud computing, how do you leverage technology to make this ecosystem drive further and continue to innovate? Um, look, we may have, because I've, I've heard somebody speaking earlier, we may have the next Steve Jobs here. You know, maybe the next Elon Musk, we can only hope and we'll all be investors. But the, the answer is yes. Uh, I, I truly believe this is a very big parallel to what we saw uh, to the internet boom. I mean, think about it, for those that were fortunate enough to have a cell phone back in the day, it was two and a half pounds, it cost you $4,500. Now they just give them away to you for free, you know, when you sign up, when you go from, you know, vendor to vendor. So my point is, yes, this is an inflection point. You have seen this parallel before. All right, that's exciting. Okay, um, uh, again, I'm gonna shorten some of these questions because I'm gonna keep us on time and I wanna get to the uh, uh, participant questions as well. So uh, Tim, next to you as a youth representing the youth of the world on this panel to a very experienced uh, adult audience and uh, panelists here, uh, what message do you believe needs to be heard and why? And, uh, and then I'll follow up with a quick question. Thank you. Um, I would like to start off by asking why are we facing water scarcity? Uh, I guess after that, I would like to say that, uh, like, what are we going to do when we go to turn on the tap and nothing comes out? Water scarcity is not a respecter of persons. And uh, it is just, it's an essential that we need to invest in. I think those are good questions. And I want to make sure that we uh, panelists uh, answer those before we uh, we leave the stage today. Um, Tim, with respect to um, the kinds of opportunities investors and markets can cultivate with your age, with the young adults of your generation, talk to us about that. How do we get people more in, interested in this, in this topic? How do we attract um, young talent and excitement to solving this challenge? Um, I would say financial security, period. Uh, you need financial investment to attract uh, people and young talent to a marketplace. So I would have to say investment. And can you unpack that a little when, when you say financial security? Uh, it, explain the view of uh, your contemporaries with respect to uh, how they look at finances. Sure. Uh, so as we all know, we're increasing with more marketable, uh, I guess, instability. We have increasing inflation, uh, less, I guess you could say, secure job markets. So for me, if I'm going to put in time and effort into a job market, I wanna make sure that it's gonna be there tomorrow and it's not just going to diminish and then I'm going to have nothing to show for it or to support a family or something like that. So you wanna be able to invest in that as a career? Correct. Okay, good, good points. 
Okay, with uh, with that, I want to uh, come to you, Minister Goldsmith, um, and uh, are, are arguably uh, the most uh, senior of the uh, government officials uh, in the room, and one who's been very proactive in this topic for a long, long time. Um, how do we as a world begin to adopt a posture that allows markets to drive forward investment in new water as we enter a time of great scarcity? What are the things that have to come together? How can we each play a role? Okay, good. There you go. um, look, I, I want to start just by saying that I, what John was talking about earlier was really music to my ears. Um, actual real examples of the solution. And there are many, you know, this is, we don't have to be clever about it. We don't need to invent whole new things. In Vietnam, for example, you've got the, uh, uh, the, the companies owning the small hydro plants, paying people who live in the forest to protect the forest, because they know that if the forests come down, the erosion will eventually clog up their machinery and cost them a lot of money. So it's a perfect little market mechanism. Uh, in Colombia, they had the worst ever storms uh, two, two and a half years ago. And they discovered that the communities where the coral reefs and the mangroves had been grubbed out were completely destroyed. Whereas the communities where those things were still there and healthy, they were battered, but they were not destroyed. And there are so many examples, even in the UK, where you've now got water companies paying, not they're not asked to by government, just choosing to pay farmers to not use pesticides in certain areas because they know it's gonna cost them more to clean up the water downstream. You've got water companies in the UK paying people to plant trees in areas where they worry about erosion causing problems further downstream. So the market, and I, and I really agree you made the point about the market, uh, and I think the market is, other than nature, is the most powerful force for change of all. But where I would disagree with you, I'm not sure it's a disagreement actually, but, but where I would add to what you said is that the reason we're having this discussion now is, and the reason we all meet at COP 26, 27, 28, and all the rest of it, is because of market failure. That there is a problem today. A forest today is worth more dead than alive. And yet we're all dead without the forests. So there is a problem there. Um, and the, the, all those millions of externalities that result from things that we do, but which are not reflected in any way in the market, there's no cost attached to them. That is the reason we are having these discussions today. So I do think governments have a role. We need to find a way to internalize those externalities. We need to find a way to put a price on those things which currently don't have a price. But it's not for government to micromanage the solution. It, innovation, everyone's, everyone's used the term innovation. And there will be solutions out there that we haven't even thought of today. But I have total confidence that as long as there's clarity from governments and regulators, the market will deliver. And the very last point I'll make is that I can give you an example of where this is true, where the, where the banking crisis, what was that, 12, 10, 11, 12 years ago? Since then, the cost of solar has come down 90%. I mean, it's an extraordinary, no one predicted that. I remember reading through the government papers in the UK predictions on, on when we would be able to have offshore wind without any kind of subsidy. And the figure they used was 2043. It's gonna be next year, way faster than anyone had predicted. Under President Trump, he was desperate to keep the coal sector going, poured billions of public money to try and prop that thing up. And yet coal use declined faster on Trump's watch than it had under Obama's watch. So the market is unbelievably powerful, but unfortunately, the market is blind to things which are extraordinarily important, and that's the role of government. Okay. And to follow up, um, there are so many things uh, competing for our attention, our money, our investment, um, all of them seemingly excited, all seemingly important. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of hype cycle. How, in your opinion, Minister, do we move water up the chain of priorities? That, 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 is, a, that is a tough one. Um, uh, and I, I, I may sound like I'm swerving the question, I'm not. I, 
in the ideal world, you would not have created a climate COP, a biodiversity COP, a desertification COP, and all these different things, and treat water as if it's something entirely separate, because all these things are absolutely inextricably linked. There is no solution to climate change without nature, and nature, and biodiversity, ecosystems cannot survive the kind of climate volatility that we're likely to have if trends continue. And water, of course, is completely central to both of those things. So my, my view is that, I'm gonna sound like such a bore now, but my, my proposal is that we focus as much as possible on nature. Nature is the ultimate solution multiplier. When you back nature, you get a whole range of benefits beyond what you were initially trying to achieve. And it's cheaper, it's faster, it's more enduring, less prone to corruption, and just provide so many answers. Our relationship with the natural world has broken down phenomenally. And our job now is to try and rebuild that relationship and reconcile the way we live and the way we do business with the natural world. I feel like I've said something terrible. Yep, What's perfect. going on? Uh, can, I make, can, can I make a follow-up point on that? Yes, um, quickly. And then quickly. Um, I know we have... Uh, a timing we have to pay attention to for you. Um, and uh, I, so I want to uh, briefly get into the micro dialogues and um, in, in, in interest of time, I want to make sure that uh, we start with Jay and, and you to take a, just a couple minutes with each other to ask uh, your questions. Um, and so we'll let you go first and then we'll follow up. Uh, thank go you ahead. so much. We were just uh, talking about who asks who what. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I've got, I've got a, um, my, my worry is that when governments regulate, they, they often get it wrong um, because they don't understand business and, and they don't understand the practicalities. And I've seen bad regulations come in, which have had perverse uh, 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 outputs. Um, so I guess the question for you is how does, how do we work better with the private sector to ensure that the regulatory and legal framework that we need is one that isn't just going to benefit the absolute giants of, of, of business, uh, but also isn't going to facilitate the kind of greenwash that we were talking about right at the beginning. So basically, how do we how do we work together? Well, you're going to ask me about my children. It's, uh, I, I think I think it's a very good question. Uh, so keep in mind, we at NASDAQ, we have an Office of Government uh, Relations. And, and the one thing in which we're always doing is we're gathering feedback on either side of the hill. Uh, we want to listen to our constituents, but most importantly, we want to listen to our partners. And, and the partners can be those that are listed already. Right? We are a service provider and those that are at some point in time thinking about it. Uh, the biggest thing that we do, and one of the biggest things, is we have a tremendous, I mean, a tremendous schedule that is comprised around thought leadership. We can't guess, and I can't guess, what anybody else is thinking. So when you're able to have forums, regardless, I would say, of the topic and understanding people's needs, wants, but most importantly, their pain points, I think that's how you collaborate. And so the biggest word you'll always hear is, for me, I will never say that somebody is a client of mine. I will always say that somebody is a partner of mine, and we're always going to collaborate this together. So when, you know, years back, we not to kind of sway from the subject, we redefined and redeveloped and implemented an entirely new process to take companies public. We didn't do it by guessing. We took the time to go out and listen to what people's pain points were. And then ultimately, how does that impact you and more importantly, your clients? I'd say, look, it, it, in today's world, I say this to my kids all the time, I wouldn't want to be a kid today. No offense. It, it's hard. It, it's really, really hard. And unless, unless there's action that is taken now, I think the future, it, it may, I don't want to sound doom and gloom, but there's work to be done. Let's just put it that, that way. So yeah, let, you have to, you have to work together. We, let's work yeah. together. Meetings like this can change the world. The people in this room, military, military, all over the world, foreign governments, domestic, local government, state, the water has been put on the back burner by the municipal authorities because that's the way they did it. That's the way they thought it could only work forever. And it doesn't. So it's getting the word out. It's working together collectively. And you said the right thing, let's work together. So something like this yeah. shouldn't be a one of, 
after 40 years or 46 years or whatever, yeah. it should be once a year or twice a year to share the information. Because when you were talking about California and what they're doing, I have countries that don't know about that. They really should. Never knew about it until just now. So that's, that's something we can all share and get a positive result pretty quickly just by being here today. And certainly the folks in this room have a worldwide impact in other ways. So I'd like to see something really where we, six months from now, eight months from now, whatever works for everybody, at least get together for another. Increased frequency, okay. Uh, Minister, I know you have to dismiss, so thank you. Uh, we're not done yet, so uh, just uh, shake your hand and, and thank you for taking part in this important dialogue. And we're going to continue the micro dialogues next with, um, uh, all right, with, uh, we're going to switch the batting order here with, with Richard and John on the end here. So uh, your microphone is going hot and uh, you two uh, can volley questions. Um, well, I was going to make a point about blue financing versus green financing and thinking about how those two things can merge because uh, climate change manifests itself through the water cycle. So um, thinking about adaptation and mitigation from in ways that have both climate benefits and water and sanitation benefits together, I think is, is crucial. But um, let me ask you a little bit about resilience, because I, I think one of the things that we hear periodically from financial institutions and investors is, is that they are aware of climate change in terms of risks and to some extent opportunities. But I think that I think some are struggling with thinking about how to quantify those risks and, out and opportunities into a framework that promotes resilience and makes financial, makes sense for them from a financial perspective. Um, so if there was any advice that you would be able to give to uh, financial institutions and investors uh, in ways that they can start to think about resilience, what would you say? That's a fantastic question. I, I, I probably, uh, I'm, I'm, I think I owe you $20 actually. <laughs> Um, I, I think uh, uh, one of the one of the points that I um, I'd like to answer with is um, I, you know I, I'm a biologist by training so I, I often have to explain things about uh, economics and finance to myself in really simple language and I, I think of uh, uh, economics is how we value things it's the science of, of valuation and I think of finance is the as, as, as the methodology is the process of how we pay for things. And, and so they're, they're intimately related, but they're also different from each other. I think the, uh, the, finance, uh, the finance world is exceptional. Uh, and this is, the, this is the strength of the market in, in de-risking. Uh, I think that the challenge that we see from climate change is that the past uh, it has turned out to be a really crappy predictor of the future now. So it, so it's, it makes it much harder to de-risk. At, at most, we do some uh, some uh, kind of modest uh, de-risking where we, we try to think of like a, a few uh, kind of simple climate impacts and they, they kind of shave some of the risk off the edge. I think the actual problem is uh, in that, uh, as, as I mentioned in my initial comments, this contrast between efficiency uh, and, and in a sense, reliability and, and, and resilience. Uh, that we, uh, th the way that we use economic tools to say do a feasibility study, what it tends to do is, is say, if, it's, if we're sure that it's gonna happen, uh, if we have really high confidence that, it, that it's gonna happen, then we uh, uh, will we'll include it, we can, we can address that. If we're less sure about it, if it's, if it's new, if it's unfamiliar, if it's something that just might happen, even if it would have a really big impact, we tend to discount that, we tend to reduce it. So one of the initiatives that we've been working on with a team of global economists actually is, is the idea of trying to define resilience as an economic concept. And, and, and because water is so essential to resilience, uh, it, it often means that we need to bring like some of the special insights that we have uh, uh, around what, what's happening to water now and what we think that it's going to happen over time. A really quick example of, of some kind of early brilliant thinking in that area DC Water, one of the uh, most progressive utilities in the world uh, uh, for the Washington DC area, 
uh, about six or seven years ago, they issued what they called a century bond. It was a really, it was a simple um, powerful communication tool. It's about three, 400 million. Um, what they did was they, they actually made the payout period of the bond a hundred years because that was the operational lifetime of the asset. Just aligning like the, 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 the finance period with the operational lifetime is actually a really powerful way to communicate to investors. Like it's not just put your money in and get your money out really quickly that you're actually, we want you to be a partner for this for the lifetime. And it's, it's thinking about these longer uh, uh, periods. And, I, and one, one other, if I can ramp, ramble on for just one other quick point, uh, a, a lot of our, our measures of success, uh, uh, the, the, the way we think about uh, growth, uh, especially economic growth, the way that we think about uh, prosperity, the way that we think about wealth, uh, those, those are our, our, our indicators for how well we're doing. But we, what we very often forget is that, is that uh, many of our measures of growth in particular, that they also, they, they assume that we will increase our use of water. We need to actually see the water that's in our growth indicators, right? And if we don't see that, then, then we, are, we are guaranteeing uh, that water scarcity will be uh, not just uh, an ongoing problem, it will be a worsening problem. So we need to be able to decouple uh, our, our, our measures of economic and financial success from water consumption and, and make sure that they are two separate tracks and that we're counting them both, but that we understand that, that, uh, that, that we're uh, that making these kind of longer term, more resilient decisions. Thanks. Thank you both. Thank you. And uh, I want to move next to uh, Paresh and Timothy. Uh, what, what, what is on your mind today? What do you want us to leave with? What's the key takeaway here? Uh, my, my, I'm sitting with the, the future of, of all generation here. Um, now, the question to me arises, right, that we as a community or actually this generation, uh, we collectively, the world, I meant to say we is, you know, we actually made a tremendous progress in this world. Obviously, we have done, the world is more, I'm more optimist than ever, right? We're living the safest time. We actually have abundance of things around, but we actually also around it, the non you know, not, not intended consequences are actually in front of us, the climate, you know, water. So water happens to be one of the things that we actually generations, you know, previous and in current generations, we did manage to actually make a mess out of it, right? So we actually currently suffering more than ever before. So, you know, few generation, a generation, I like to ask, what do you think when you're going to inherit this, this world with this sort of challenges we have? What do you think of previous generations of what do you think as far as what we should do currently, what do you ask of us to do right now that we actually should start doing today so that we don't actually, at least we start to correct as something what we actually done so far. Well, I would like to say that the majority of youth today do not think about water scarcity or water issues. It's just not on the forefront most part of their mind, um, which is why I'm excited and glad that you guys are here today and you are looking into this issue. And I'm hoping that when this is able to get posted on social media or wherever, that they will see this and then this will be raised to their attention so that we can find a way to fix this issue. And I don't wanna have to have a future and I don't want anyone to have a future where we don't have drinking water or supplies to do basic needs that we have had for thousands of years. I just think it would be immoral with mankind's future to use it all now and leave nothing for the future to come. You know, I, I will tell you that I know what you ask for us to do. I tell you what personally that I want to do. Um, you know, I, I, I would like to, as an individual, to actually give my, I call it pay forward in a way to, to youth. I want to tell you whether it's you, the future water. Personally, like myself and many other innovators in the world and then people actually doing some solutions like we, along with my brother, um, Jay Patel in India and stuff. So we actually have taken commitment to actually have the innovations like Genesis Systems or other ones you know, who actually can solve the problem. Personally get committed, invest, action, be on the ground and actually solve the problems in real time to actually do that. So I would actually have your generation ask of you know, other people to just make sure they get involved. You know, that's what I would ask for. Obviously, personally, I wanna do it and I encourage everybody to just participate into doing something for the future of the youth. Thank you. Um, I guess my question would be, 
what are what are the rest of us going to do to secure water security? And what would the financial backing behind that look like? To give a quote or to paraphrase a quote from Warren Buffett, be in the essentials and water is an essential. It is required for every part of our daily lives. And I want us to have that in the many years to come. Yeah, I mean, I, I again, I will encourage everyone to get involved in business community. You could do well by doing good. And, and I think that message will resonate, invest into water and water technologies. And like I said, we currently, with our partners in India, we're doing that, you know, action right now. So I think um, more you speak, more you ask of us, you know, puts us on a you know, line and we want to do more. Timothy, you actually asked a very good question earlier. Um, among others, but <laughs> one I'd like to harp on a little bit. Uh, what happens when the water turns off? Um, the obvious one is, you know, it's no longer inhabitable anymore, but I think there's a, there's a bigger picture here that isn't fully understood that, uh, so let's take a hypothetical that the, the Southwest runs out of water, uh, of its own natural water. Um, that doesn't just impact the Southwest, that impacts the rest of the country because there's going to be an economic analysis done that says, is it cheaper to buy our water somewhere else and truck it to us? Or do we move all of our civilization elsewhere? It's going to be cheaper to truck it, which means that the water prices in other parts of the United States or even Mexico or Canada are going to go up. And those economic forces are going to impact everyone in the country and possibly the entire continent. Um, so it's, 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 I, I think that's probably lesser known and something that the market needs to understand um, as to why this innovation is so important to be to be focused on. So just wanted to answer that question before we end. Thank it. you. Thank you for asking that. Well, thank you all. Um, and uh, we've come to the end of our time. We're going to have to close it out here, but thankfully uh, some of our panelists will be able to uh, stay tuned uh, and answer questions um, for this. I want to say it's a true pri privilege to have each of you here today to help st start the fire on water investment. You don't have to be shy about asking the hard questions. This is about our future. We're in the water action decade, and we're here to help put the wood behind the arrow, put force to the effort in, in this place and time. And, you know, great efforts in humanity start with small groups and we thank you for being a part of this small group. We invite you to participate going forward. We invite you to share this um, uh, segment of the UN Water Conference uh, with your social media network. And we ask you to help us to spread the fire as each of us leaves this room here today as a water advocate for change and a sustainable and renewable uh, water future for all of humanity. Thank you very much. And we'll this, with that, we will conclude and begin the networking portion of this meeting. And a report of this meeting will be provided to the uh, uh, water conference. And um, again, we thank you for being here. We thank you for being on the record. Thank you to our panelists for the travel, for the inputs. And uh, thank you to all the organizers and for NASDAQ for sponsoring this event as well. And to all the co-conveners, uh, the organizations, thank you.